Um, so, the, the, the talk is mainly about code, but first I'm going to do something a little bit different. Now, some people, as it says here, say that seeing and believing, but I'm going to show you that's not true. I'm going to show you that several times. So, take a look at this picture. Um, it's a cafe base. By the way, just out of curiosity, does anyone know what the word cafe bait, what's special about those words? You can write them in hexadecimal. Excellent. And that hexadecimal number has a special place in the world. Um, anyone? Ellen? Um, it's the start of the Java class file. You got it. So basically that's the magic number at the start of every Java class file that identifies it as a Java class file. But anyway, in this case, uh, that's kind of secondary to the purpose of this. The purpose of this is that this is not what it might appear to be. When you look at these letters, do they look tilted or do they look straight and true, horizontal and vertical? Tilted. tilted. They look very tilted. About roughly to me how many degrees tilt do you see? Out of curiosity. 30, 30 degrees. 30, 30 degrees. And, and now I'm going to prove to you that they're set straight and true. The way I'm going to do it is I'm going to um, put transparent yellow paint on top of the letters, but I won't move them. So watch the screen very closely. Whoa. Now do you believe they're straight to truth? Mm -hmm. yeah. If I take the paint off, they look tilted again. Mm -hmm. By the way, this um, very old illusion, this was known in uh, 1908 a little. He did use the word cafe <laughs> 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 Alright, now um, this one, you guys are a bit too young, but there's this retro gaming thing now. Has anyone played Cubers? Yeah, yeah well there's Cubers. <laughs> but this is a very special Cubers. Um, look at the horizontal faces of Cubers. See? And what do you see here? Um, like how many colors do you see on the horizontal face? <laughs> Most people see two. They see dark gray, light gray, dark gray, light gray. Can you guys see that or no? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So, how many colors are there? One. One. And I'm going to prove it by disappearing the front face. I'm not going to change the horizontal face. I'm simply going to disappear the vertical face. And now you can see the horizontal face. Mm -hmm are the same. And I'm even going to tell you how this one works. If you look at the vertical faces, you'll see they have gradients on them. Dark to light, dark to light, dark to light, dark to light. So this guy is surrounded by dark to light gradients. And so it looks dark. Whereas light to dark, light to dark, light to dark, light to dark, this is surrounded by light to dark gradients, so it looks light. Now that you know how it works, it doesn't work anymore, right? They all look the same. No, no, it still works. You know, this is deep in your brain. This is the way we see stuff. Merely knowing that we're getting fooled doesn't necessarily prevent us from getting fooled, at least in matters visual. Um, luckily, it works better for code. So we'll get to that later. I have uh, one more for you. I'm going to be in the wrong direction. Anyway, that's all right. Um, coming. All right. Here we have a flag. Now, does this flag look like it's all parallel lines, or do you see any, any way? A little waviness. I'm going to prove to you that this is in fact all square, all set straight and true. And what I'm going to do that is I'm going to remove the little boxes from the big boxes. And by the way, for all you Java programmers in the house, this is what is known as auto unbox. <laughs> auto unbox is gone. And now you see that it is in fact a checkerboard. All the lines, horizontal and vertical, are straight. Bring them back. And you see the curve again. Mm -hmm. So now I'm going to do the same thing in code. I have just shown you a bunch of simple drawings that look like something, but are something else. I'm going to show you eight little Java programs, each of which looks like it does something, but generally does something else. And might keep you on your toes by throwing one in that actually does what it looks like, but for a different reason, you know, because they all have to have some trick. And I'm going to ask you. What do these programs print? And you're going to tell me, but to make it easier, it will be multiple choice. I'll have four choices for each one, and I will pull the class, and then I'll reveal the mystery. But it's not all fun and games. Once I've revealed the mystery, we'll delve into why this bad thing happened and how you can avoid falling into whatever trap was demonstrated by a program. So at the end of the talk, hopefully you'll be a slightly better job of programmer because I will have taught you some of the sort of the darker recesses the language. And by the way, most of these puzzles in this particular talk apply to other languages as well. A few of them are Java specific. 
but this way, you know, I understand that we live in a polyglot universe and many people program as much, you know, Perl or Python or whatever. I don't know why I said Perl, that's kind of a little too, but you can use Python, you know, Haskell, whatever your favorite language is, as they do uh, Java, and some of these apply to all languages. So, without further ado, the first one, uh, time for a change. Um, this one is like a brain teaser, but it's not a very hard brain teaser. Okay, if you pay $2 for a gasket that costs a dollar ten, how much change do you get? And before you just scream 90 cents, remember, we're geeks. You don't just scream 90 cents, we write a program. <laughs> so I've written a little Java program here to answer that part. It says, this is about a print 2.00 minus 1.10. So my question to you is, what does it print? Does it print 0 0.9? kind of drop them off that last digit, can't remember how many digits there are on the input. So they put 0 0.90, remembering the digits. Or does it vary maybe from implementation to implementation, depending on whether you're running OpenGDK or IC or you know what have you. Um, or none of the above. It's just something else. Those are your four choices. So take a moment to look at it. This one's simple enough that I won't won't really give you a moment. I'll ask you right now. <laughs> How many people think this prints 0.9 choice A by show of hands? And by the way, the total number of hands I get has to include everyone in the room. You're going to have to vote for something. <laughs> Just flip the coin if you can't come up with one. So we got one tentative vote. And don't vote tentatively. You know, that's a curve. <laughs> you might be wrong, but let me tell you something. I, you know, we were all wrong on most of these. That's how they got to be puzzles. These are things that people genuinely fell into the trap. So anyway, we have one vote for choice A, 0.9. How many votes for choice B, 0.90? One vote for choice B. <laughs> How many people think it, it varies depending on the, you know, which version of Java you're running or the day of the week or what have you? Um, I see about five of you. Ten, ten, three, and. All right, I mean, how many for choice B, none of the above? The great majority of you, and in this case, the great majority of you are in fact right. It turns out that it always prints out exactly this, 0 0.899999, etc. And by the way, the number of nines is fixed. You always get this many nines. And the intuition behind this is that decimal values, I think I mentioned this last time here, cannot be represented exactly by a slope or a double. So here we're using, implicitly, we're using double. That's what these constants are. When you say 2.00 or you know, 1.3 or any. It's a double literal in Java. I'm subtracting two doubles, and then I'm printing the result. And it turns out that because you could not rep you can represent 2.00 because it's an integer, so it's not exactly an integer, but it has no um, uh, non-integral part. So it's equal exactly to an integer. But this one, 1.10, cannot be represented as a sum of negative powers of two, as I explained last time. So it does the best it can, and then when it prints it out, it turns out that the printing is specified down to the last decimal. It's an algorithm due to Guy Steele. Um, and the idea is that you print as few digits as possible to distinguish this value from the nearest value to it. And in this case, that requires printing all of these digits. It's sad, but it's true. So how do we fix this? Well, here's two ways to fix it. One is you can use big decimal, which is a class for representing arbitrary precision, fixed point decimal quantities. And if you make a new big decimal of 2.00, that is exactly what it said. It has exactly two digits of precision. Um, and same with 1.10. It is not represented as a binary fraction. It's represented as an integral quantity, 200 in this case, 110 in this case, and a scale times 2 to the negative in both cases, i.e. there are two digits after the decimal point. So if you do an exact calculation and print an exact result, 0 0.90, that's great, letting the computer keep track of the decimal point like that for you. But it's also a little bit expensive because you're creating these big decimal objects and messing around with them. So another option is to simply use integers and keep track of the decimal yourself. In this case, in essence, we've switched the computation from dollars to pennies, 200 pennies minus 110 pennies, and the answer is you get 90 pennies and change. Well, if the guy actually hands you 90 pennies, you know, every right to get set. <laughs> but, so that, that's how you can fix it. And what can we learn from this one? 
the moral is to avoid floats and doubles when exact answers are required. Floating point arithmetic is actually a great thing for engineers, for scientists, because it lets you represent numbers over a very wide variety of ranges, from little tiny things darn close to zero up to humongous things times 10 to the 233rd. But the price you pay for that is you lose the exactitude that you get when you're working with integers or big decimals or all. Right? On to the second problem. This one um, is related to the first, kind of updating on the first result. The change is going to come. It turns out to be a very old song by this guy, Sam Cooke. Um, same, same problem. But this time, we take the advice of the first version of the puzzle. And I've improved the program a bit more than that as well. Notice that I now have these little uh, temporary variables, like I say the payment is a new big decimal of 2.00. The cost is a new big decimal of 1.10. And then I print payment, uh, subtract the cost of payment minus cost. So this one, you know, it's a nicer program. It tells you what it does. And I am using the big decimal. So does this one work? Does it print 0 0.90 or does it print 0 0.9? Does it print the same garbage the first one did? Or something else? Those are your four choices. I'll give you a moment to look at this one. Oh, by the way, you are allowed to talk amongst yourselves. Um, you, if you know the answer, don't share it out. And yeah, if I see anyone actually typing the program, <laughs> <laughs> We're looking at the home video. Uh, yeah, right. This, this is what the spec says. The spec says for that constructor, 
new big decimal of double. Translates a double into a big decimal, which is the exact decimal representation of the double binary floating point value. Well, we know that the double 1.10 is not actually equal to 1.1. Uh -huh. It's e and, and doubles, you have so many digits of precision. There's 64 bits in a double. I think 11 bits are the exponents, something like that. So you have about 53 bits of precision. And when you print that out exactly as a decimal, you get the total sewage. That will give you exactly the right value, and it will preserve all the magnitude, the um, precision information. So this actually will print out 0.90. So that would be two, two digits after the decimal point quantities, subtracting them, and the result has two decimal points of precision. And what can we learn from this one? Well, first of all, use new big decimal of string, not new big decimal of double. You simply shouldn't use this constructor unless it's what you actually want, which doesn't happen very often. It turns out that that only works at compile time, right? If you actually know the string when you're writing the program. If you don't, if you somehow got a double in computation and you want to turn that double into a big decimal, then what you do, don't use the constructor. Instead, use big decimal but value of double. This is a static factory, which makes a big decimal. And the spec for this says that it gives you the big decimal that is equal to what would be printed out if you printed that double. And it turns out that that will give you what you want much more often because of the printing algorithm that I was talking about before. So in this case, it would actually give you the right answer. It turns out that if you print 1.10, it really does print that one. Anyway. Um, if you know the value at compile time, use the string constructor. If you know it at runtime, use the value of um, the static factor. But you know what? This is really a puzzle about API design, a topic I talked to you about last week. What's really happening here is you're falling into a very bad API design, and one that I am responsible for. Um, it turns out that the Java.Math is the first thing I wrote in the JDK after arriving at Sun in 1996. Um, and the mistake that I made here was you should make it easy, as I told you last time, to do the common thing, and difficult or impossible to do the rare thing. So you got, you know, you want to make a big decimal whose value is 0.75. The obvious thing to say is new big decimal is 0.75. Sadly, it doesn't do the right thing. As soon as you type 0.75, you're dead because you've already got a double. So what should I have done? I should not have provided that constructor at all. I should have provided a static factor with some sort of esoteric name like exact value of, or something like that, or exact value of double. You know, big decimal by exact value of 0.75, and that would have been reasonable. And then the common, the easy to use method should have done the right thing. Um, and I simply should not have provided a constructor that appears to do one thing and actually does another. I violated the principle of least astonishment and broke a lot of people's programs that they were over the next 15 years. So it's a cautionary tale. All right, next one I call Animal Farm. Um, how many people have read George Orwell's Animal Farm? About half of you. Actually, I thought I had some picture of it up there, but the picture should have gone away. Oh well, I'll put it back in later on. But anyway, um, as you know, if you read the book, um, they discuss kind of whether all animals are treated equal, or some more equal than others, you know, there are the pigs and there are the dogs. So this program is like vaguely, vaguely modeled on that, barely, actually. And what we do, we have one variable called the pig. And I set it equal to the constant string, length, colon, ten. There's a space in between there, okay? And then I make another string, and the strings themselves by their final. Final string dog. And I set that one to length, colon, space, and then I append pig.length. What is pig's length? Well, let's count together. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So I'm appending the one zero characters to length colon space. And then I have this print statement to compare. I say animals are equal plus pig double equals dog. And the question is, what does it print? Does it print animals are equal true? Animals are equal, false. Might it vary 
uh, depending on you know, let's say, museum, what day, beta moon, um, or none of the above. So just print something else. Should print true, and in fact, this version of the program does. 
And I should point out that this is another kind of, this is actually a language design problem as opposed to an API design problem. You know, the easy thing to use is double equals. It's fewer characters, it looks nicer than dot equals. They should have used double equals to do the value comparison. If you override the dot equals method, then double equals should automatically invoke it, and a lot of more modern languages do that. Um, but I think that was one of the cases where they made the wrong decision in the design of Java, violated the principle of least astonishment, and that one is responsible for many, many bugs. So what can we learn from all this? First of all, use parentheses, not spacing, to express intent. Why? Because the compiler ignores the spacing, unless you're programming in um, Python, and even then it ignores this kind of spacing. You know, so honestly, if it's worth communicating, communicate it using parentheses so that the compiler as well as the reader gets your communication. The worst thing to do is use spacing to express your intention, because you can do what we did in this program, which is express something which is not what the program does, so it's just confusing. Um, you, in fact, if you have any doubt as to whether you need parens or not, use them. They don't cost you anything. They're free. And they make the program easier to read, which makes the program easier to maintain, and they may save your bacon if, in fact, you were wrong about the order of evaluation. So, be liberal in your use of parentheses. You know, I don't think you would ever take points off someone for using too many parentheses. So, go ahead. If you, if you have any doubts, you know. Uh, also, never depend on the interning of string constants. By interning, what I mean is taking the same value and returning the same object. It turns out that, in my view, erroneously, the Java language spec guarantees that under certain circumstances it will do this. Who cares? Never write a program that depends on this. Because a program that depends on this may be working, but it's only working temporarily. As soon as someone starts you know, modifying it, they'll break it. It's a very, very fragile program if it depends on object identity rather than object equality. Um, so, so the other main lesson here is use dot equals, not double equals for strings. You should almost never use the word strings. All right, the next one's called the match game. And it's based on a game show from the Code of War. That seems to be kind of what ties all these problems together. So they don't tell you from before you were born. Um, and this one is about pattern matching. Um, you guys have done regular expressions at some point? Yeah, by just curious, by show of hands, how many people have dealt with regular expressions in any language at some point? So maybe three quarters of you. Well, the idea with regular expressions are there's one in here. They're uh, like a little language that let you express a kind of class of strings. So in here, I have this regular expression, which is open paren AA bar, AAB question mark, close paren plus. And what does that mean? The, the bar means or. So this is either AA, that is the actual string, lowercase a, lowercase a, or the string AA B question mark, which means optionally followed by a B. So AAB question mark matches AA, it matches AAB, and it doesn't match anything else. It doesn't match AAC, because you know, C isn't B, and it doesn't match just an A, because it doesn't have AA. So this guy matches exactly one thing, this guy matches two, and when I put them together with the OR and the few parens, it matches either of them. So it will match AA or AAB. And then plus says, whatever occurred before it, I want one or more of them. So this guy will match AA, it will match AA, 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 AA. In fact, it will match any even number of A's. It will also match AA, B, AA, AA, B. You get the idea? That's what regular expression is. All right, so let's take a look at our program here. What we do is we take, um, we make a, a pattern. And the way we do that is we call pattern.compile on a regular expression in string form. And what compile does is it turns the string into what's called a finite state machine, which is just a little object that can fairly quickly, well, I mean fairly quickly, but it, it, it's an object which can test whether a string matches that regular expression. And the reason I said fairly quickly was it avoids the cost of parsing the string. You only parse the string and make that finite state machine once, but then you can use it repeatedly. And that's just what we do in this program. I have a variable called count, I start it at zero, and then I generate a bunch of strings. How many strings? 200 of them. The first one is the empty string, 
I continue as long as the length of my string is less than 200, and each time through, I append an A. So the first string I generate is the empty string, then A, then AA, then AAA, and so forth. Basically, a string consisting exclusively of A's, and I go for the first 200 integers starting at zero, right? Um, and if the pattern matches the string, then I increment the count. So I'm basically just keeping track of how many of these 200 strings match the pattern. Now, uh, as we said before, it will never match an odd number of strings, of A's, right? But it does match an even number, A, 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 and so forth. So of the 200, how many are even numbered? 100. So I believe that count should be 100, and the program should simply print 100. What saves? The choices are 99, 100, which throws an exception, or none of the above. Before the sun, and she says the sun will be the earth. 
That doesn't point. Point. <laughs> <laughs> like, in a string in a string little how would you call it? Kind of like you did this last week in the interview. But I will tell you, the sun's lifetime is general, generally between the eight, nine billion years, something like that. That's billion, ten to the nine. This is ten to the fifteen. So it won't even come close. You know, our our solar system will be long dead before this program stops running. Uh, the problem is that the regular expression See, I say regex, that's slang for regular expression. It exhibits what's called catastrophic backtracking. And I'm going to show you what that is with a little picture of that um, finite automaton that I was talking about, what you get when you compile the regular expression. I'm going to show you how the machine tests whether the string AA, AAA, that's five A's, matches the regular expression. Now, does it? Will it say yes or no? No, 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 it's an odd number of eights. It's got to fail. But here's the problem. It doesn't fail quickly. It says, okay, let me first check whether the first two characters match AA. They do. That's great. What about the next two? Do they match AA? Yeah, that's great. And what about the rest of that string? Do they match AA? No, nope, sorry, because there's only an A remaining here. And A doesn't match A. Do they match AAB? No, nope, darn it. So they go back to the last unanswered question. And that was here. And do I say, do the third and fourth <laughs> characters match AAB question mark? Well, do they? Yeah. Yes, they do. Good. So I'm here. Now I check that last fifth character. Does it match double A? No. Does it match double AB question mark? No. Fail. So we go on until we visited all the nodes of this. This is what is known as a complete binary tree. Does that ring a bell? Have you guys done those? Yeah. Right. So do you know how many nodes there are in a complete binary tree of depth N, roughly speaking? N over two. Oh no. no. That that would mean two half the depth. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It's yeah. it's two to the n over two. It's exponential. <laughs> two to the n. You know what exponential growth means? Yeah. You know, remember putting yeah. the rights on a checkboard and all that? Yeah. Basically exponential growth kills you. So, you know, in this case, <coughs> what is the value of n? Well it's like uh, two hundred. So it's order two to the hundred. It's just a gigantic number and you're simply dead. How do you fix it? What you do is you find a simpler regular expression that has the same functionality, that matches the same set of strings. In this case, it turns out the AAB question mark matches the AA. So when we said AA or AA optionally followed by a B, the first half of that regular expression would do nothing for you. But it did make the thing into an X, you know, a binary tree as opposed to a straight line. If you have a straight line of depth n, it has n nodes, and you can run through it in linear time instead of exponential time. So here's a little sort of cheat sheet for you. This is actually very much worth remembering. If you remember one thing from today's talk, remember this. If an algorithm runs in linear time, it's instantaneous. It's going to hit return, and you have your answer. If it's quadratic time, you can get a cup of coffee, and you get your answer. If it's exponential time, you can die and you fool complexity. So and by the way, uh, you know, that's somewhat clear. There are, there are exceptions, obviously. If n is guaranteed to be really small, then exponential may not be a problem. But if n is even like ten, eleven, or twelve, exponential starts getting pretty darn big. Um, so what the reason that, that A A B question mark works so much better is that you don't have this bushiness. In, in the tree, the straight line. And the moral is, since regular expression, as implemented in Java, and by the way, Java got it from Perl, and just about every other language these days, with a couple of exceptions, including Go, some of you were the Go talk before, turns out that if you ran the same program in Go, it would run very quickly. We'll get to that in a moment. Except that it would not accept that regular expression. That regular, it has a more limited regular expression vocabulary. Um, we'll get to that in a moment. That's actually the third bullet. So, to avoid catastrophic backtracking, ensure there's only one way to proceed at every layer in, in the match. You know, make sure that when you have these kind of A or B or C things, that you never have a substring that can match multiple ones of those things, because that's what causes the exponential blow up in the tree. And it goes way beyond Java. This is this is where I should said what I've seen before. It, it, it affects most languages, but it turns out that in the earlier days of computer science, like back when Unix was being written, 
um, I think it was Rob Pike who wrote the first regular expression matcher at Bell Labs. Does that sound right? I'm guessing his name. Anyway, um, and it actually matched only what are known as regular expressions in computer science. It's a very limited class. If you ever learn about the Chomsky grammar, I don't expect any of you to actually remember this stuff yet, except for Alan. Um, regular expressions are the, like the simplest class of them. But it turns out that the computer, when people talk about regexes, they actually go way beyond the Chomsky type 1 grammar. It turns out that it's like Turing complete. Anything you can do with a computer, you can do with regular expression. You would want to do it that way, but you could do it that way. Um, and in fact, there is this group of people who say, that that is crazy, that we should have simpler regular expression grammars that permit only things that can be evaluated quickly. And if you want to read more about that, then go to this URL here, and you can read this guy, Russ Cox, raving about it and talking about how we're all idiots and the designers of Perl are big idiots. Um, I don't think I actually agree with him, but you know, it's, um, it's an interesting argument. Anyway, as a practical matter, on this planet right now, Regular expressions do exist this catastrophic backtracking, and you can have a denial of service attack if you can somehow make a server get into one of these nearly infinite loops. Technically not infinite. Technically, we'll finish it in 10 to 15 years. But um, you know, how could you maybe get a server to do that? Some servers actually accept regular expressions on input. You can kind of say, look up all the things that match this regular expression. And if the server actually just hands it to a normal regular expression evaluator, you know, you just suck down a CPU over at the data center. Um, and then a little sort of mini lesson is just because you can express something concisely doesn't mean it's quick to evaluate, especially in, in modern languages that have, you know, closures and all manner of things. It's often impossible to express very long, very complex computations in very few characters. So don't confuse short with quick. All right, this next one is called Histogram Mystery. Um, and this is probably the most complicated program that we have today. Um, in this program, I have four words. Uh, those words are in this array called words. They are I recommend apology lubricant. And I take these four words, and I'm going to make every combination of two words that I can from the four. So we like I, I, I recommend, I apology, and so forth. And for each of these things, I'm going to compute its hash code, and I'm going to make a histogram of the various hash codes that I get, mod five, because there are five possible buckets in the thing. And I'm going to print out the sum of the values in the histogram. And my question is, what does it print? I'm going to go over it in a little more detail so we can figure out what it ought to print. Okay? So, what do we do? First of all, we have a private static final string which is initialized once at the time the class loads to contain these four words. And then we have our histogram, which is five ints, that is primitive int values. They're initialized to what value, what value in Java? Zero, always zero, and you can, you're guaranteed, unlike C, where you can get garbage in there. In Java, you're guaranteed zero. So then I iterate, this is using the um, for each loop that was added in Java 5. Uh, for the string word one in words. So that takes each one of these words and sets word one to it. Now I have a nested loop. Inside, I iterate over the same collection, the same array, in word two. So this nested loop goes through every pair of words. It goes through, you know, I, I, I recommend, I apologize, I lubricant, recommend, I, and so forth. You all see that? The nested loop makes sense? Good. Um, and we then simply take these two words and concatenate them to make a word pair. I've suggestively named the variable pair. I believe in naming the variables well, even if they're, you know, just little local variables. Um, and now I compute a bucket, a histogram bucket, from the word pair. How do I do that? I compute the hash code of the word pair, and I take the absolute value of that. Does anyone know what absolute value does? The distance from zero, i.e., it takes negative numbers and makes them positive. So if I pass in negative three, the absolute value is positive three. So basically, we, we, we take our hash code, which, which is 32 bit integer, maybe negative, maybe positive. We take its absolute value, and then we take that mod the histogram length. What is histogram.length? Five. 
So we take it mod 5, um, and that returns an integer between 0 and 4 inclusive. Okay, so basically we're selecting which of the buckets it falls in, in a histogram. And then we take that bucket and we increment it. We add 1 to its value. So if there's nothing in the bucket, I mean, it had value of 0, it will then have 1. Then when we're all done, I have this variable which I suggested we call pair count. And I iterate over the entire histogram, or any frequency in histogram. So that is the frequency of each modded hash code. And I add to pair count the value of that frequency. And when I'm all done, I print that pair count, um, although I, I have this C thing, just to make it a little more interesting. But anyway, I print the pair count. So what should the pair count be at that point? Well, we don't know which bucket every pair falls into. We take the hash code, we take the mod 5, you know, so we have something like, I recommend. What's its hash code? I don't know, some number. Take it mod 5, some number between 0 and 4. Go into that bucket, add 1. Well, every single one of those 16 things added 1 to, some of bucket, to one bucket. And then we add up the sum of the contents of all the buckets. What should it be? 16. So this should print out C, 16, right? <laughs> so the question is, does it print 83 C16 X or none of the above? And I will tell you one thing, just in case you find this helpful in solving the problem. And I'm not saying you need to solve the problem, but it turns out that the ASCII value of capital A is 65 in decimal. Have at Turns out that so can that mod operator. Remember, he said zero to four. Mm -hmm. 
Let's take another look at our program. <laughs> These words were chosen very, very carefully. <laughs> Meaning, I recommend college you move with this. just Josh being silly. But no, but it turns out that the dot hash code is a integer dot min value. Oh. I chose those two very carefully. Why integer dot min value? What's so special about integer dot min value? Well, it turns out that, does anyone know what negative integer dot min value is? Anyone? Negative 17 e to the third. No, 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 this is integer. Oh, right, right. It's not e and e. It turns out that negative integer dot min value is integer dot min value. Here's the, the real problem is ints are not integers. Ints are these fixed length things that have their own rules. Integers are this lovely mathematical abstraction where you have infinitely many of them. And, you know, they're very sensitive. But let's think about what happens when you negate integer dot min value. Does anyone know the representation of integer dot min value? No, all ones in, in, in an unsigned ink, which Java doesn't have, because Java is broken in that regard, um, all ones would mean um, the biggest number that you could have. If you have all ones except for the high order bit, okay, so you got a zero here, and all ones this way. Um, did I do that right? Uh, no, I didn't. I have to remember, because you guys are reading the app. Yeah. <laughs> zero is here. So zero here, and all, all, all ones bit, right? So the sign bit is zero. That means it's positive or zero, and all these are ones. That's the largest integer that you can represent. Mm -hmm. But to get the smallest one, you have to sign bit as one and all the other bits as zero. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And do you know how to negate a number in Java or any other language or computer that uses two's complement arithmetic? Do they teach two's complement arithmetic here? Excellent. Not all. I had this discussion. Um, a lot of colleges don't teach this anymore. They all should. It's still a fact of life. You know? So that is what you're using in Java. So do you know, can you tell me in words how you negate a number between two complement arithmetic? Is it something to invert? Negate it. First, anyone? Oh, can you flip everything and add one? Very good. Flip everything and add one. So we had a one here and all zero. Now we flip everything. What do we have? Zero. A zero here and all ones. Now we add one. One plus one is zero. Carry the one. Zero, carry the one. Zero, carry the one. Until we get to the sign bit. Zero plus one is one. And we're back with one here and zero all the way down. <laughs> we're back where we started. <laughs> Ouch, that's broken. Does that mean two complement arithmetic sucks? Not exactly. <laughs> See, here's the problem. There are an even number of integers, right? You have 32 bits, so there are two to the 32 possible values. One of them is taken up by zero, and that leaves an odd number of non-zero values. That means you can't have a positive for every negative. There has to be one number whose negative is not part of the system. And that's integer dot min value. And it just so happens that if you apply the negation operator of integer dot, not, dot min value, you get itself. That's an unfortunate fact of two complement arithmetic, but one that you have to be aware of, or it will bite you. And this, this program exploits that. So, polygene lubricants by hash code is integer dot min value. Now, how do we pick the bucket? First, we take its absolute value. It's negative, so add negates it, returning itself. So we have, you know, it turns out to be minus 2 to the 31 is what it is. And then we take that mod 5. So we're taking the negative power of 2, mod 5. Now the mod operator in Java, it turns out, is defined to have, if it doesn't, can't return 0, it returns something whose sign is that of the numerator, of the first operand, right? So this guy is negative, so the mod operator is also going to return a negative value. What negative value? I don't even know. I mean, something between negative one and negative four. I don't know or care what it is. Actually, I think it's negative three. But the point is, you know it's going to return a negative number. Mm -hmm. And once you try to use that as an array index, you're dead. Mm -hmm. So we never even get down here. The program blows up while we're still up here. Mm -hmm. um, it turns out there is a bug down here, which I heard some of you noticing, which is that I'm adding to the character C rather than the string C. So it turns out this is not appending pair count. What it's doing is the, the, the character implementation in Java is quite deficient. A character is really an integral quantity. So it's, it's like a 15-bit a, a unsigned int. And it doesn't act like a string at all. 
So here I'm adding two integral quantities, 16 bits unsigned and 32 bits signed. And if you add two in, the result is it takes the bigger of these two types. That's called a primitive widening conversion. So which is the bigger type, the character or the int? Which has more bits in it? No, character is 16 bits, and it is 32. So you're adding a little int called the character and a big int together. You get an int. So in fact, this is going to print an int. And what is the value of the int? Assuming the program ran that far, which it didn't, well, it would be 16 for pair count plus the capital C. I said A was 65, B is 66, C is 67, 67 plus 16 is 83. So that's kind of, if that's not this thick, it will print 83. So what can we learn from this one? The, the biggest takeaway is ints are not integers. They act funny when they get very big or very small. In particular, math.app does not guarantee a non-negative result. There is one value for which it does the wrong thing, and that is integer.min value. Um, also, remember that the mod operator in Java is not a true mod operator. It doesn't return something between 0 and modulus minus 1. It returns something of that magnitude, but with the sign of its first operand. So it is a modulus, so to speak, but it's not the positive one. It's the one whose sign matches the first operand. Um, and then how to actually act on it is if you have a signed hash, oh dear, sorry. Um, <laughs> if you have a signed hash value and you want to turn it into a bucket, then what you do is either do the mod operator before the add, or you can shift it to the right one, thus discarding the lower bit, and then mod it, or you can mask it, discarding the signed bit, and then mod it. Or if it happens to be a power of two length array, you can simply look at the correct number of lower bits. All right, the next one is called Glomer Pile. Um, once again, it's about to show that <laughs> off the air before you were born. Um, it's the glom objects in the array, and we append those objects to the array. So you give addition to a string, it's in fact doing string concatenation. And if a thing isn't a string, it's automatically going to call the two-string method on it, right? Um, so basically, it's going to turn all of the contents of that array into strings, go on them because it prints six somehow, actually interpreting these things as ints. Does it print one, two, three? Does it throw an exception, or does it do something else? It does throw an exception. It throws a class cat exception. Um, <laughs> it actually says, glomerator in these method definitions, but it is not parameterized anymore. So this runs correctly. Well, types are put in there for one reason, and that is backwards. Um, and because that's, you get cell division here. <laughs> it's not actually about cell division. It's about division of long, hence the title long division. So here we have two constants. One is suggestively called private static final long millis per day, the number of milliseconds in a day. And we get that by multiplying 24 hours per choice B, 1,000. Ask for why it prints 5. The intuition is silent killer. I do mean silent. You get no warning. It just blows up. You know, amusingly, in the program we had here, it blows up at compile time. And you still don't get a warning. Right? Um, so it turned out to be a long class. So um, <laughs> this one's called it's elementary. Um, because it involves only elementary arithmetic addition. In fact, the whole problem is addition. It just does these two, make two separate print statements to make it look good. So, does it print choice A, 17777, followed by 44444? Choice B, 17777, followed by 43878? Choice C, 66666, followed by 44444? Choice D, 6666, followed by 43878? And you can see that there are two. Uh, as for the intuition, well, first of all, the program doesn't say what you think it does. We'll, we'll go into that in a, a little detail in a moment. And second of all, leading zeros can cause trouble. You might think, like, two characters. This is an acute angle. And this is a right angle. And this is a lowercase letter 